Hello everyone, I am Bradley Sword, Associate Professor of Computer Information Systems at the College of DuPage in Glen Ellen, Illinois. And this video today kind of cleans up a little bit of all the little odds and ends that are just sitting around waiting to clean up before we move on to pointers and structures and object-oriented programming and beyond. So this lecture is going to look at exception handling, try-catch blocks, and then it's going to look at string and character classes. Again, we I'm sure we've talked about these kind of things previously, but we'll just look it over one last time. And then we'll use try-catch blocks and discover, you know, discover how to advance our understanding of input validation past the, uh, the while loops that we've written in the past. So I have Visual Studio up and running over here. And so this whole idea of exception handling, and say it's, it's a tricky thing because it, it becomes more of an issue as you start using other people's libraries because more, more and more people are using try-catch blocks and exception handling and throws and things like that in their libraries. And so standard template library. That's why we haven't really been using it up till now, and you really wouldn't need it for the rest of this course. It's just uh, just showing you because it's part of the textbook and just having it in there. Just why not? And so the the old approach to things was just to kind of return a zero or a one, like a pass fail. Did everything succeed in a function or something like that? That was the old way of doing things. And so C plus plus introduced this idea of exception handling. I don't know the history of exception handling because I know you can do this in Java and I know you know like the various languages have various versions of exception handling using try catch and finally and all different types of blocks but when a function occurs an exception is handled but like in a lot of cases if I'm using the standard template library and I'm using either a vector class or one of these other special things and something goes wrong well, how is the person who wrote this library 20 years ago going to know how I need to solve my problem today? And that's where the idea comes from. Basically, it's just someone, you know, if, if code goes wrong, a red flag goes up or just a flag goes up and goes, something's wrong. And it's up to me to figure out, once it screams out something's wrong, to figure out what to do to fix that. And if I don't fix it, the computer will halt. Because just like a divide by zero error or any of those other errors that you've probably experienced by now, when that occurs, your program will halt. And so, but this gives me a chance to find an error when it pops up and fix it however I see fit. I could make sure nothing happens. I could just let it silently fail, like a video game where a sound effect doesn't play. My game shouldn't crash if a horn can't play, but my game pro should probably crash if I can't load a level, or, or my program should crash if some kind of credit card record is coming through and it's using a wrong data format or something like that. There should be an exception that gets handled so I can I can fix it and move on to the next thing if I can you know if I can get through this, get on to the next thing. And so there's there's you know, like three keywords, try, catch, and throw. And so let's just see if I set up let's just set up a how to do this here. Um, how are they doing it here? Exception, throw, try, catch, they have, here's a try, catch block. And so this, if you know that certain functions can throw exceptions, and so like in this case, if I set up, and just for the sake of this, let's set up a vector. I'll need a vector, and I'll need to include vector. And this is just to show you that things can go wrong. That's, that's all I'm trying to, that's all I'm going to try to show you about this. Vector V, and I'll just set up some values in here. Here we go. And if I try to access and I try to print V at like the, let's just say the ninth element, what would come up? And so one of the things is with the template libraries, you just have to know all these little odds and ends and you just get experience by using it for five years like I did out in the world, that this does not really check anything. Let's see, does it crash? Actually, it does. I get a debug assertion failed. And so that's not good. That's not an exception. That's an assertion. Assertions are a whole nother ball of wax that we're not going to dis discuss today. So yes, this is not a good idea. There's, and, there's, and it's irrecoverable. I cannot recover from this error in the way that the code is written at the current time. But what I can do, let's see, what happens if I put a try catch block in here? And so I say, try to run this code. And so if this code is successful, then we're all happy. But if something goes wrong, let's see if we can see what went wrong. And, and the type of, ex it's called exception, I'll just call it exception E. And right now I'm just going to put a C out and say something went wrong. Because we know what it was, I just don't need to. You know. But in the real world, maybe five or six different things can go wrong and you need different checks to see what's going on. But this is just a quick 
outline of what exception handling is all about. But this, the same thing, like so I'm saying, the same thing occurs. We added all this new weird stuff, try catch and all this kind of thing, and the, the, the debug assertion, this thing still failed because something went horribly wrong over here when I tried to access this with this function. Whoops, and you can even see, oh my goodness, here is this. It's unreadable. This is C++, but it's basically unreadable to us. What went wrong right here at this line of code? Oh my goodness, who knows, right? Me included. And so understanding these kind of things, like understanding that I should be using an app function, I'm not forcing it, like, you should not know this, of course. Those of you in C advanced C++ should know this, but uh, those of you taking the intro courses. But this allows me a, a different mechanism to find an error when it pops up and, and catch it and just squelch it and move on. And so I run this code. Oops. <laughs> Hold on, I'll get there. I promise. Come on. Okay, let's run this from the start. And now something completely different happens. And now something went wrong, prints out. And, and my program actually continues running and runs to end. And so that's, a big, that's the big deal here, that a second ago it was irrecoverable. There's nothing I could have done with that line of code to keep my program running. But now because I use this idea of if I find a problem, like an exception, not an assertion, if I can find an exception, I can catch it and do something with it. So maybe I just print out something went wrong, or maybe I just, or I stop my program. You know, it depends on, you know, if a file is supposed to open and it doesn't exist and I can't do anything without it, well, let's halt the program. And so that's the whole idea of the try and the catch is using other people's code, and they are the ones throwing exceptions, basically going, something's wrong. I'm like, in this case, you can't do this. You can't access element 9 of a 5 element vector. Okay, fair enough. And so what is it? It's, it says here that two t fundamental types cause exceptions. The inability to obtain a resource over which the programmer has no control. So if I'm trying to get access to an object and it doesn't exist, or if this or that, there's lots of different things that can occur. There's a resource in my computer that is somehow inaccessible to me. Like in this case, the ninth element doesn't exist. I had control over that, but you know, but just to say that's a different subset. And errors that can be checked and handled over which the programmer has control. So let's do something just a little bit different here. Let's set up a function that will return the uh, integer division of two numbers. Division int a, int b. And so it all comes down to something like this. You would think it's like, oh, I'll just return a divided by b. You would think that would be so nice and so easy. So how about I just, how about I go see out here and say enter two numbers. And then I can see in, I have to keep track, I need those two variables. Here I'll call them x and y on this one. Int x, int y. And I'll just keep it easy. Oops. And c into x, c into y. And then print out division of x and y. And so you run this and you're like, well, I don't see the problem. This is sort of two numbers, 5, 4, and there's my 1. This integer division. But what if I do 5 and 0? 5 space 0, enter. I get a crash. Unhandled exception at this little place in time here. And you're like, okay, you just taught me about all this pretty well here. What if I try? Just try to do that. I can, you know, just try to return a division. And if something goes wrong, I'll catch that exception like you just showed me, Mr. Stoll. And so exception E, I'll just return. I guess I'll return nine, minus 1. I don't know. I'm just, who knows? But just to do something, right? Or maybe even print out and return minus 1. Because I still need to return something from this function. Yeah, but, um, but on the other hand, should I be catching the information here? Where? See, that's the question with try catch blocks. Who needs to fix this problem when it pops up? And so, in this case, is it my problem? Is it the code? Is it the function's problem? Or is it my problem when something goes horribly wrong? And there, that's, there's no answer to this. It all depends on the situation. And that's, that's why there's exception handling in the first place, because it's your decision on what you want to do when an error pops up. So if I just do something like this, and so, you know, but, but then what happens if something goes wrong? If I have a try block, I have to have at least one catch. That's just the rule. And I just erased it all. I'll just type it in again. So I'll just take an exception, and, and again, I'll just have to, I'll just return zero. I'll return negative one. 
And let's try to build this and let's see what, oops, build and clean and whatever. I'm hemming and hawing, but I, we get to the same place here. I put five and zero in and it crashes just exactly the same because for whatever reason, that's a hardware exception, I guess, rather than a software exception. And, and so, so this the, the integer division by zero still crashes it, even with all of these checks and balances. So, so you know, say, so for as much as we try, try and catch here, there's got to be a different way. So all we can do here is use a completely different mechanism and say, if b equals zero, then I want to throw an exception. And then I can say, uh, divide by zero. Like, why should I have to do this, right? But you have to. And then the throw returns back. It's like a return, but it's an immediate. we'll show this in a second here. And I'll throw exception. But if this doesn't fail, then I can return A divided by B. Because only a zero on the B side is the only thing that won't work for this, you know, for this mathematical function. So we could try this again. So we're like, okay, enter two numbers, five and four, get one, fair enough, five, zero. And now you see, oh boy, it says unhandled exception, blah, 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 in memory. This is different though, right? This is not the same error we saw a minute ago with the divide by zero error. This is an unhandled exception when it comes to STD exception not being handled. And so what happens is, I can, this is not the coolest, because like, but what happens is you have a call stack. Functions are calling functions, which are calling other functions. And all of this information is being stored in your computer in what's called the call stack as your program is running. And so, in this case, there's only two, basically, there's a, the main calling division. And when I was working out in the field, when something would go wrong, especially when I was using Lua and that kind of stuff, you would see that I was like 13, 13 function calls into my system whenever something would go horribly wrong. And then, of course, the system works fine, so I have to find the first instance where my code is breaking their code. Because it's like, very rarely would you ever find anything wrong with theirs. But anyway, coming back, so what happens is, when I throw an exception, I, I'm basically unwinding the call stack to figure out who can answer, who can answer this and fix this problem. And there's nothing inside of this, in this division function, there's no catch going on here, because it's like I need to catch it. So it goes back from division, because that's where it is here, this is the top of the stack, and then it goes back to the function that called it. It goes back to here. It says, is there anyone here that can catch this mistake? And right now there is not anybody to do that. So then that's the final scroll. Main can't catch it. This does not catch it. And so your program halts, and that's where this is coming from. But the exception, literally and figuratively, is that, that now I have a mechanism to actually stop this from occurring by using a try catch block on this end. And so I can say try, try to do all this work. And if something goes wrong, just print it out so we can go on and do other things. This is, this is not the end all be all of programming, catch exception handling, but I can say, okay, it'll pr every, if everything goes right and smooth, it'll print that out. But otherwise, I want to print and you just have to know this, and there's a, there's a function called what, and it'll print out divide by zero. Whatever I put in here, it'll print that out. So that's it. Try, catch, and throw all in one example. So five and four gets me one like it did before, but coming back one more time now, five and zero gets me that divide by zero error, and my program continues on. And that's the whole point. Again, that's the whole point of try, catch blocks is that when things go wrong, and exceptional things go wrong, not just every little tiny thing that can go wrong is an exception, and to say, like, you know, not everything becomes, you know, something, you know, and not everything's a, a nail or a hammer now that you got a nail or whatever, whatever that phrase is. But you can see that it's a big deal because now I can throw exceptions, I can try think code out, I can catch them, and we'll see this again in a couple minutes here when we discuss how to use a try catch block and uh, work with uh, input validation. Okay, so the string class. We know about the string class. We've been using the string class. I'm sure there's been other discussions. I, I remember doing them, but are they false memories at this point? I've been making hours and hours of videos. But the string class permits string literal values. You can, so 
it's kind of difficult. Remember that there's a there's a balance between C and C++ that this comes out as a const care array. Now we know what arrays are. And so you say this is the C style way of doing things. And remember, it adds the null terminating character to this. And so that goes against the normal idea of what a string is. I'll probably have to include string here in this way. And again, just as a reminder, string turns that lighter blue because, specifically because it's part of C++ and not part of the, the fundamental C, C, C++ C++ language. And so, let's see. And yes, just like any other array, the first character in your string or in your character array is coming from zero position. And then everything else is an offset, just like any other collection of data, any other array of characters and ints and floats and anything else you can imagine. And so under the hood, we don't 100% know where there's, there are rules, sometimes there are rules and sometimes there are not rules on how data has to be implemented by these kind of data structures. So is there a null terminating zero in this or is there not? I don't have an answer. I don't have access to the code to be able to go in and find out. So it could be something like this where I set up Bradley Sword, in this case, hello, and they set up five characters of data. But they could very well just use just a plain old character array under the hood and add the null terminating character for us. And there's no way to know. And it doesn't necessarily really matter because when we're using the code and everything works the way it's supposed to, are we going to care? Are we going to notice? Everything just kind of works for us. Only sometimes when we have to delve in deeper. You know, and I've never had to delve in deeper to go, does that null, is there a null terminator there, yes or no? It doesn't much matter. But just understand, at least for the strings, it doesn't matter. With a, with a character array, it absolutely does. So uh, let me find this. Let me find uh, one more time. Let me look this up, and then I'll get back to here for cppreference.com. The string class is one of the biggest, most important classes we have because pretty much all data comes across as a string of characters. And how we parse that data, how we unload and unpack, and what do we do with that data? I mean, there's trillions of different ways that people can access that. So we need to have a ton of different ways to construct data, to set for equality, to find specific characters in a string, to get the front or the back. Conversion. How do we convert a C++ string into a C string? Well, there's a function to do it. We have ways of going through and iterating through, like a loop almost, every uh, character in the string using these things called iterators capacities and reserves and lengths and empties, clear and insert and pushes and pops and all these things. You know, it's like, just keep on going, right? Look at all, uh, relational operators, erases, get line. We'll talk about all these other, there's, it just keeps on going here. And there's even helper classes for this kind of stuff. So I say, I've, you know, I've only worked really pretty much in video games professionally, so I've never had to technically go in and you know work these things down like that someone else that was someone else's job in you know other parts of our library system but you know but even so there are times where you have to take substrings and you have to do weird kind of stuff okay so different methods different string methods and again character positions if i wanted to i could print every character in my in my name for and i equals zero, i is less than name dot length, or size, I think you can use both. Let's use size, size is the more convenient one. Plus plus i, c out, name at the i position. And then I don't need a space, and then I'll put an end line here. And this is, this is one way to do it. I mean, I could just do, I mean, just saying, like, <laughs> that's printing out every character individually. I could just go ahead and just go name. Just <laughs> that's easy. I can do that. But then you can see it comes up twice here. Bradley Sword, Bradley Sword. Because, yeah, I can just go ahead and say print the string and it knows what to do. And I can also go ahead and print a character for character. I can, I can access things character for character. I could say name of four equals capital W. And what does that change? Of course, it changes the fifth character to a... Uppercase W, Brad, Brad Weesworth. Okay, so different functions. They say we can use C out, we can use C in. But remember the difference between a string and all the other data types is that that space that, I, that generally delimits and tells me one number has ended and another has begun, 
I need to use different functions if I care about that for a string. Like in this case, my name. I know I've done this before. So I need to use the getLine function, something like this, if, if there can be a space in the string that I want to be included in the string. And so just to say, like, if, you, if there is no space character, it's fine. But if there is, it also includes it. So this function basically will keep looking until it finds a new line character and not a space character. So just so you know that that exists. Um, let's see, strings can be manipulated. I can, you know, you can add them together. You can concatenate them. Whatever, I'm just saying, like, so that just puts that in. It just concatenates. Oh, it doesn't concatenate. Wait a minute, what? Hold on. Maybe just because I'm rebugging and debugging. Expression must have integral scope. What in the world? I, you can't do this? <laughs> uh, the fun of the fun of C++, right? You know, this is a character array. Why isn't, it, why isn't IntelliSense helping me at all here? This is a character array. And what if, instead of this, I say name plus equals? And that's the fun of C++ programming. You would expect that to be able to work. I could add two strings together. But remember, C++ doesn't think they're strings. C++ thinks they're character, const character arrays. And it doesn't know how to take a, a const character array and concatenate another const character array to it. But the functionality of C++ with the string class, it knows that it knows how to take a name and add a character, a const character array to it properly. And this will actually work. There we go. So there's Bradley's word assignment one, blah, 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 and all the other stuff. Okay. So, all right, is that about it? You can, yes, we can, there's all that functionality. If you're interested, go look it up. This is not necessarily 100% important for right now. So coming back, there are ways to, you know, manipulate individual characters. And we are showing, we could go through and, and we could just do, basically just go in with surgical precision and change whatever we want to change inside there with no problem whatsoever. And so what if I wanted to go ahead and upper, turn my whole name into uppercase characters? That's kind of where, maybe not this is what we're going with, but if I wanted to do something like that, I could go ahead and say for, and this is the strange thing, there's no C++ library function where you just pass in a string and it just magically works for you. But I can say, coming back again, for every character, or what's cool about this is we can actually use the range-based for loop for this. Isn't this cool? Watch this here. So let's say, for every uh, character reference C, which is part of name, C equals to upper C. And so now this will work. And now I've uppercased every character. You have to do it manually for whatever reason. It sucks. I agree. But there you go. There's Bradley Sword, all uppercase. And it know, and like I said, this function knows if I've had any other characters, it's like, what's an uppercase three? That's not three is not a case, a case for taking a number and putting it into uppercase. So there's Bradley Sword three. So this is a way to do these kind of operations on a character-for-character -character basis within a string. But as you can see, there are character I.O., put, get, peek, put back. You could peek at a character without, I don't know. There's a lot of little things you can do. And again, it's not that it's outside my pay grade, but it's outside what we normally do on a day-to-day -day basis when it comes to programming. We generally don't go out of our way to access data like this. We just kind of sling it around but we never really delve this far. Okay, so the final part here we're going to look at for this shortened video, hopefully shortened video, is a look at user input validation. Okay, so input validation. We've already covered this when we were looking at while loops earlier, but now, as I said, there's now that we have access to try catch, now we can find a way because you know, like, let's just kind of come back to this and say, well, what if I want to see in into an integer? I guess I'm never all the stuff. And I put my name in, right? Like, and then I go C out A. Okay, so what will print out if I if like a, if I put an integer in, I put a, a seven in, and it goes seven comes out. But what if I put my name? Brad. Zero comes out. And and that, we're lucky there, but but that's not good, right? And so, like, we need to, to find a way. I'm surprised that actually worked. I, mean, I thought it would crash on me. There, there are ways to get it to crash. I can never remember. Students always find it, then they show it to me, and I forget. I don't know. 
but but we need we can use try catch blocks inside of all of this or zeros and all that to make sure that you know that that doesn't get that that's not a problem when it comes to this kind of stuff. There is a way to infinite loop, it's a stupid thing. But anyway, so coming back, let's just real quick then because it's only a couple slides here of all these things. Validate so just to say, of course, validating input is essential. Garbage in, garbage out. And so we don't want to worry about too much about that kind of stuff. But what if I could create a function? And I'll just say call I'll call it int. I'll say get integer from user. And and then actually what I'll pass in here is a string reference for what you want the prompt to be. And that's kind of cool. And so what you could do is you could see out the prompt. Okay. And then let's just kind of remember what we need to do. It's an oh. So this is the last integer thing you'll ever need. Get use integer from user. And I go, well, what is the integer value of the low? What's the low value of the range that I can accept? What is the high? And if you really want to play around with it, you really want to be fancy, you could set using that numeric limits thing. So if and use default parameters. So if they don't input any of these kind of things, then you don't have to worry. So I was just saying, like, you, this could be, you could really, really, really customize this function and use this as one of your personal library functions forevermore. But I can print out the prompt, okay, and then while, uh, and then get the input, int input, and get the input. Let's just do this without worrying about the try catch part of this. And then what I can do here is I say, okay, while the low value. I'm sorry, while the input value is less than low, or the input value is higher than high, then we can see out error try again. And then we could steal this here, the prompt, and, the, and get rid of this guy there and say, okay, print the prompt again. And then when it's all said and done, I want to return whatever my input was. So now I can do some kind of function down here and say int a equals get integer from user. And I can say enter a value between 0 and 100, colon space, comma 0, comma 100. Oops, semicolon needed. And so now enter a number between 0 and 100. And I go 101, you go, nope, try again. And I go negative 1, I go try again. Zero, okay, zero worked. Let's just try 100 just to be safe on the other end to try all the, okay, all the fringe cases seem to work. Our while loop seems to work, but again, ah, Bradley Sword was seen as zero, right? That's not right. There, and what are you supposed to do, right? It's, and it's part of the range. And I don't, I guess an exception didn't get thrown here. So I'm like, I really thought we would be doing a try catch block. This is easier in other languages, but let's try it out. Let me see. Let me, let me put it in, and then we can talk about it. All right, you learn something every day. So exception handling, I didn't know as well as I thought I did. Just, I, I wonder what language I'm thinking about. But anyway, here is the updated version of everything I was talking about. So now this does work. So now I have a do while loop, all sorts of stuff. I'll explain it here. So I still have the prompt that needs to be put up on the screen. I still have the low value and the high. So I passed along, enter a value between 0 and 100. I pass along the 0 and 100. Perfectly legitimate. And then I say, okay, I have an input is what's coming from the user. I'm going to eventually return that. But I have to make sure that all of whatever I put in here, I have to make sure that no matter what, when I fall out, the input is valid. And I can make sure that no matter what gets input, as long, if it's invalid and it doesn't equate down to an integer value between 0 and 100, I have to kick out and say, nope, sorry, try again. And so, so I get my prompt, and I print it out. I get my input string from the user. So now this, is, this was the difference between everything else. I have to take a string and try to parse it into an integer. And there's a function called s to i, and I know story looks weird, but it's string to integer is how it reads out. And so you give it a string, and it does its best to give you an integer value, which is in this case put up to this input. If, it, if something goes wrong, it throws an exception. And that's, that's the key here, is we want, we want that function to throw an exception, 
if anything comes out not right and not an integer value. And so I try to do my code. And so I, I can't just return input because it could still be invalid, right? I mean, it, and so it doesn't much matter what's happening here. Um, actually, this is interesting. But anyway, so when it comes down to it, I'm, I'm trying this thing out, which, you know, whatever. And it, if I catch the exception, at least when it, if I type something in with a different data type, like a string or just a plain old character, this will print out and say error, try again. But however, if that doesn't work out, then we'll try it here and say, okay, we'll need to come back around again and do this again. That's like, I guess error, I guess, you know, like error in data type or something like that. Because this error will only pop up, it, it won't pop up if you're out of range, it'll only pop up if you type in the wrong stuff. Okay, so enter a value between 0 and 100. P, error in data type, try again. Oops, I have a breakpoint. Oops, you went... Uh oh, oh, was it? A, did, I, did I crash my program? I don't understand what I just did. Let me just see. X is identifying. What the frick is going on here? The only thing I could imagine, maybe because this thing is technically uninitialized, if this thing is throwing an exception. So let me just see. Low minus one, something that's smaller than the lowest value could be. So enter a value between zero and one hundred. I put a P in. There we go. I, that's all it was, was there was a little tiny mistake, and that's all it takes is a little tiny mistake, even though I thought I was so smart, I even found one right there at that moment, right? So, so what happened was that the input value is uninitialized when it gets to here, and programs have a horrible time with uninitialized data, and this wasn't working out. So, okay, I put in a P, I put my name in, try again, and say space, because it's not expecting that. This is where things get weird. You can't always fix this up every chance you get. And so you could put ignores and stuff like that in, but you know, how often are you going to encounter this out in the world? Nobody nobody has console C++ programs anymore, right guys, right? But anyway, so then I could put 101 in, but notice there's no error that's just out of range. Negative 1 is out of range. 100 in range, I'm finally complete. And so, not my best lecture of all time, but you get the point. You got to see me. You got to see me fluster a little bit here, and just kind of push through, and find solutions. And that's what we do as programmers. We don't know every detail. We really don't. There's no way to know every detail at these these kind of levels. We just find a solution that works because we needed to make sure that if I put in a, a character or put in a string, that it doesn't immediately kick me out because a zero is what the, the other stuff printed out or spat out as the value for that parsed string. But then at the end of the day, zero was my low end. So that's not right. So this, this helps me out. So then zero counts. Zero counts as a as a you know on the on the edge of the boundary. But again, if I put in a character, it doesn't kick me out immediately. It forces me to continue on and try different things. Okay, so that covers everything. Try catch for sure. Strings and characters. It's up, you know, it's one of those that just all, it just, these are just little odds and ends that apparently even some of us get confused upon. But you say, you could take this and expand this out even more because you could have the prompt, you could have a const string for what is, you know, like, or, or what is the error, what is the error prompt? And because right now, you know, it, it's pretty good because it's, or you could, instead of making you print this part, you could put that as part of here. The sky is the limit if you want to change this up. But this is pretty cool because this will always get me an integer value in the range. I don't have to. I can. I can just pop this into my programs, and anytime you know, just like Python, right? Get input. You have your get input right now. You have your. You put your prompt in. You put your range in. Everybody's happy. Anyway, so moving on to bigger and better things. Next lectures will be pointer related, right? We're moving on to the the final the final unit: pointers, structures, and object oriented programming. So I will spend some extra time learning this over just a little bit more so I don't hem and haw through this next time I see this. Commit it a little better to memory than I thought I had in my memory. So you should do the same too. So anyway, swordb at cod.edu is a good way to get a hold of me if you have questions even after all this. And uh, YouTube comments below. Go ahead, send me a comment, and I will respond as quick as I can. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.